Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for coming this evening. Uh, I should say Jenny, Jenny suggests this is, this is definitely a more a recent area of interest for me. Um, but I should also say that, um, you know, I, I do history by day with the Vermont Historical Society, but I spend all of my free time uh, with my own horse at the barn. So horses have been a lifelong interest. And uh, in researching Morgan history, I, I get the chance to combine um, my two favorite things, uh, horses and history. Uh, so I'm going to present for you tonight uh, sort of my framing of the, uh, the history of Justin Morgan's horse figure. And we'll go uh, into the background of that horse and, and some of the myths and stories surrounding him. So we're going to start by screen sharing my PowerPoint so that you can all get um, the visual right alongside me. All right. So we're going to start by clicking over. Come on, PowerPoint. Um, so... <laughs> The first thing I want to start with uh, talking to you about talking to you about this evening is um, is history, right? This is a talk about history, and it's a talk about a, a kind of history that's really hard to get at. Um, so when we do history, history is the story of the past. Um, it's the story of what was written down, what people told to each other. Um, what we read about, what people wrote and talked about then, what we read and talk about now. Historiography is the history of history, right? So it looks at what stories people told at certain points in time, why they told those stories and how those stories changed. Um, because history doesn't necessarily stay the same. And the way we think and feel about a moment in history does not necessarily stay the same. I think that's uh, something we're all thinking about a lot right now with current events. Um, you can always look back and, and change your perception uh, of things that happened in the past. And we can always go back and look at sources and think differently um, about those sources or find new sources that may shed new light on an historical event. And I want to point out, too, that, that as historians, we're, we're often using unreliable sources. Um, you know, think back if someone told uh, the story of your life through your journal uh, versus through your, your arch nemesis's journal. Um, you would get two different, very different stories on your own life. So those are challenges for historians. And why I, I say all these things to frame um, a talk today about the history of an animal, which makes it twice or even three times as hard for us to, to get at um, a quote unquote what really happened because animals don't, don't leave a written record, right? And if one of the main ways we get at history is, is through reading um, or, or studying things that, that people create, we don't really get any of that with, um, with an animal. So how do you tell uh, the story of a horse? Um, you, look at the, you look at the people around him. And I also want to point out to you that when we're talking about a horse tonight, you know, we look back and we think of, of the first Morgan horse. We think of figure. Um, he's achieved this sort of mythical status. But during his own lifetime, I think it's probably more accurate to say most people, well, you know, certainly fond of him, would have thought of him and, and most of the other horses in their lives more like we think of our favorite tractor or a, a car we were particularly fond of um, at one point in our life. They were, they were farm machinery. Um, they were useful things, not necessarily the sort of beloved things that we hang all this emotional baggage on to today. So that kind of makes it twice as hard um, when we think about telling the story of a horse um, at this point in history, because you know, let's all be realistic. Like, I loved my first car, but is it really going to, you know, have made an impact beyond me? Or am I really going to have really recorded its moment in the historical record? And, and I'm, you know, like I said, we don't think of horses that way today, but certainly people would have thought of horses more like that back then. So um, it makes it twice as hard to find them in the historical record. So let's, let's jump back into history. And we're going to start... Uh, a little later than, than our horse figure, we're going to start with these two gentlemen. Um, their names are, from, on the left, that is Jen Nane and Daniel Chipman Lindsley, and on the right, a man named Joseph Battelle. Uh, and these two gentlemen are crucial to telling the story of the first horse. Uh, Daniel Lindsley, in 1856, wrote for publication a book called, I'm going to read you the full title because it's outstanding. It's 340 pages. He wrote a book called Morgan Horses, a premium essay on the origin, history, and characteristics of this remarkable American breed of horse, tracing the pedigree from the original Justin Morgan through the most noted of its progeny down to the present time. That is, in fact, the entire title. 
Uh, Lindsley was born and raised in Middlebury, Vermont, and when he was a young man, he was an engineer, and he went out west, and while out west, he discovered the Morgan horse, ironically, he went from Vermont to the west, which at that point was, was Ohio, um, became briefly obsessed with the Morgan horse, and came home and started researching the Morgan horse, um, which at that time, his argument was, was sort of fading um, into the background. Not a ton of people had them, not a ton of people have heard about them. It was starting to take on the feel of history. So he writes all around saying, have you ever heard of this first Morgan horse? Did you meet this horse? Did you, did you know Justin Morgan? What, what, what can you tell me? And he basically publishes everything everyone sends him in this book. He's not really a discerning historian. He publishes everything he can, which is actually great for us now because we have a lot of different perspectives then, right? Um, but it also means that there are four or five or even seven or eight, depending on how you count them, different variations on who this horse was, sometimes told from completely opposite points of view. But Lindsley does that really exciting and useful work of first setting down this story of the Morgan horse. And he starts to, um, he writes down some of the first stories that we associate with this horse today. And he passes the baton, or more accurately, he sets the baton down. And then a decade or so later, a man named Joseph Battelle picks it up. Battelle also, uh, coincidentally, born and raised in Middlebury, Vermont, um, becomes a businessman. And towards the end of his life, um, also gets really, really into Morgan horses and also um, picks up Lindsley's work. And it's to Battelle that we can really credit the Morgan horse as a breed today. Because what do you need to make a breed of animal? You need um, defining characteristics. Uh, conformational characteristics, physical characteristics, you know, what is the shape of the head? What is the typical color? How tall are they usually? And you also need a pedigree. You need to be able to say that for a purebred horse of whatever breed, it traces its ancestry down through a certain line. Uh, Lindsley had sort of started that work, but it's under Patel that it really becomes um, the Morgan horse breed. He, he takes Lindsley's work to the next level. He tracks down more people who say they knew Justin Morgan uh, or they knew the original horse um, and that they have horses descended from this horse today. And he puts it all together um, in a book that first publishes the history of the Morgan horse breed and, and a very long essay on why he believes it is superior to any other horse breed. And then he starts to put together these pedigree lists, this registry of Morgan horses. Now, uh, Battelle's work starts to be published in uh, the late 19th century, 1870s and 1880s is when he really starts publishing his, his work, um, which if you do the math is almost 100 years uh, after the first Morgan horse was born and almost 100 years after Justin Morgan himself had passed away. So you're starting to get the sense of why it's gonna be so hard um, for us to get any real read on, on what really happened with this first horse because these two men are operating at best at the absolute best, 30 years after the horse died, and then 50, 75, or 100 years after the horse and his, and his owner passed away. Um, but they, again, Battelle codifies um, some of the things that we think of and, and know about um, with this first Morgan horse. So let's go back to um, Joseph, uh, excuse me, Justin Morgan himself. Um, let's let's jump back from Lindsley and Battelle to the sort of somewhat murky or occasionally murky origins of, of this story of this, this special horse. So Justin Morgan, um, who was Justin Morgan? Uh, he uh, was born in West Springfield, Massachusetts in 1747. He's the eighth of 11 children, and there's a lot of Morgans in and around the area. This is a view of Leicester, Massachusetts around 1800. So, you know, the, the land that Morgan grew up in would have looked a lot like this. Leicester's not too, too far from Springfield. Um, so he was a farmer. He came from a family of farmers. Um, we don't know a ton about his early life. Um, we know that he, he bought, bought some land after his father, along with um, part of the barn that belonged to his father and the rights for the animals to pass from the barn through the barnyard to his own land. Property was extremely specific. We know that he married uh, his cousin, Martha Day, and um, they began having children. And we know that he was a devoutly religious man. He, he joined his local church. We also know that he did a couple of uh, different things with his life. He was primarily a farmer, as I said, uh, he began uh, composing music and, in fact, teaching music um, pretty early on in Springfield, but that was, uh, and that would later become his primary source of income, but it was not his only source of income. We also know he kept a tavern for a little while. He sold, um, he sold alcohol out of, basically out of his house, um, sort of kept a room in his house as a tavern. 
And he also, as a sort of side income, uh, served as a stallioneer. And what is a stallioneer? Uh, a stallioneer is, at the time, in the 18th century, was a person who purchased or leased stallions from other people for a season, uh, a couple of months at a time, and he bred them to local mares and charged, um, quote, per the leap or per the season, either a guarantee that your mare would be in full um, to this stallion or just one attempt at breeding, and then you hope that your mare is in full to the stallion. And so Justin Morgan had a number of horses over the years, a uh, number of stallions over the years that he kept either at his own uh, farm and people would bring their mares to him, or sometimes he would move them from uh, tavern to tavern in the area. And he would place newspaper advertisements like you can see here, uh, saying to people that he had this stallion. And, and there was a whole network of people who did this. Um, Justin Morgan traded stallions back and forth with a number of different people, some of whom will crop up later in this story, um, so that you could get a little bit of a genetic variety in an area. And right, everyone wants the, the, the hot new thing. So uh, after two, maybe three seasons with a particular stallion, uh, Morgan would trade him out for another one so that he could introduce a new type to the local gene pool. And uh, we know that uh, one of the stallions that Justin Morgan um, stood, uh, that he kept at his home, was a stallion called Beautiful Bay. Uh, and this horse is significant because a lot of later accounts uh, call this stallion the sire of what would become that Morgan horse, um, who was named Figure. Um, we know that Justin Morgan stood Beautiful Bay, or sometimes as he is known, True Britain. And we know a little bit more about this horse. Some people will say that they're absolutely certain of who it is, that it's a particular thoroughbred stallion that was owned by the Delancey family. Morgan himself later claimed um, that this horse was owned by a Colonel Delancey. The Delancey family were uh, New York loyalists um, who had a great deal of money and spent a lot of it on horses. So they absolutely had very, very nice thoroughbred horses. They, they could have had this, this stallion named True Britain. And um, surrounding the stallion is one of my very favorite of, of the myths or stories about this horse figure. Um, it goes that this horse, True Britain, the sire of figure, the horse that would become the first Morgan horse, was a purebred thoroughbred stallion owned by a man um, named James Delancey, who was an actual historical figure um, who was not terribly well liked. He was a loyalist British officer who um, was known for brutality. And the story goes that this horse was stolen out from under his nose, galloped to Connecticut, where he was um, renamed um, Beautiful Bay from True Britain. And he circulated around between various uh, stallioneers and breeders and eventually ends up with Justin Morgan. Um, I think it's a great story to have this first quote unquote American horse sired by a horse that is stolen from a, a British officer during the American Revolution. Is that's like a perfect comic book style origin story for an American horse. Is it true? We don't know. We do not know, actually, interestingly, that uh, a horse was stolen from James Delancey around this time. But various stories have this horse named as a gelding, um, in which case he could not have sired other horses. Others name his, um, his name is Goliath. So maybe not the same horse at all. But it's, it's kind of fun to... To, to think about why people would have shared this story. Why, why would they be telling Lindsley and Battelle years later, oh, he was sired by a thoroughbred stallion, a purebred thoroughbred stallion stolen from the British, um, like all good American things in the revolution taken, uh, taken from the British. So this is really where some of the myth-making around um, figure gets started. We do know that, uh, that uh, Morgan stood this horse for absolute sure, and that he later says um, that figure was sired by a horse owned by James Delancey. Is that uh, propaganda? Is he just trying to like talk up his horse, or does this reflect an actual reality? It's, it's a little tough to say, but it sort of tells you how we get started with the myth-making and the stories around this horse. So Justin Morgan um, leaves uh, Springfield, Massachusetts um, in, double checking our, uh, our date here, in 1788. And he moves to Randolph, Vermont. Um, this makes a lot of sense at the time. Uh, a lot of people are doing this at this time period. As we know from the early history of Vermont, um, it, increasing amounts of European settlers are coming from Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, 
uh, and they are moving further and further north. Land in Vermont is comparatively much cheaper than land in the more heavily settled southern parts of New England. It is the quote-unquote frontier uh, for European settlers at this time. And Morgan's brothers, um, two of Morgan's brothers anyway, had already preceded him and uh, moved to Randolph, Vermont. So he, he, he's got family there. This makes a certain amount of sense for him. And he could sort of um, both get additional land and also, to a certain degree, expand his business in other areas. Because remember I mentioned earlier that Justin Morgan um, had a sort of side business in composing and singing music. Um, I would argue that during his lifetime, Morgan was actually best known uh, as a composer and as a singing master. Now, by singing master, I don't mean maybe what you're thinking of, which is, um, you know, like a vocal coach um, today. That's, that's not quite what he would have been doing. Uh, singing master means more that he was traveling from church to church, whether on a Sunday or on another day when they were holding worship, and he was kind of directing their choirs. And, um, and you may be coaching them a little bit, uh, having them rehearsing with them a little bit. Um, but he was sort of um, directing a certain style of music within uh, what were largely congregational churches in New England at that time. And he composed a number of hymns, some of which are still sung today. Um, there's actually a, a fairly famous one, the tune of which uh, it's my favorite, of course, because the tune is named Amanda. Um, and he wrote lyrics to it. It's sometimes sung with those lyrics, and sometimes the tone, a tune is used uh, to back up other lyrics. Um, but you may, if you, if you attend church and sing, you may have actually sung this um, in your church today. Uh, I'm going to drop real quick. A, I, I don't want to take a chance on streaming video over a Zoom connection, but I'm going to drop a link real quick um, to you in the uh, chat and um, let you know. Uh, no, I will do it afterwards. I, oh, up there it is. There's the chat. Sorry about that, guys. Um, I'm going to drop a link to you in the chat uh, of a uh, YouTube video so you can hear um, the song, uh, Justin Morgan's Amanda, with his, his lyrics. They're kind of depressing lyrics. It's, it's a mournful song, sung in the style in which he would have been um, coaching uh, chorus, choirs at the time, which is often today referred to as shape note singing if you're familiar with that. So that's what he would have been doing with his, with his choirs. So Justin Morgan has moved to Vermont, and you're probably wondering by now where the horse starts to come into the picture. Um, the horse comes into the picture uh, shortly after this. And it's a little unclear exactly how Justin Morgan gets this horse. Lindsay and Mattel both report people later. Uh, and the most common story is that someone back in Springfield owed him a debt when he went back to collect on this debt. That person gave him this horse instead. That's usually the version that people tell today. Um, it seems that he bred this horse himself, but whether he kept the horse, it still belonged to him and someone was taking care of it. Whether he had sold it on to someone else and was then given it back, we really don't know. At some point, he goes down to Springfield, and when he returns, he is now the owner of a horse, and not just a horse, a breeding stallion. And this is one of those few moments where we can actually see in the historical record that Justin Morgan has, in fact, acquired a breeding stallion, because the state of Vermont had passed a law in um, the late 1780s that required uh, anyone owning a breeding stallion to report the value of that stallion um, at a certain amount within their grand list, um, which is the list that, that helps determine taxes. It basically is it's a, like a property tax. So for the purposes of your property tax, a breeding stallion is considered um, of value. And we know that Justin Morgan's grand list, um, grand list value jumps by that exact amount, as if for a breeding stallion um, during this time period. Uh, so Justin Morgan now has um, this horse, and this is just to, to give us some context. He's been in Vermont on and off for about four years, and he's moved his family up in the early 1790s, and this is now the summer of 1792. So, um, oops, sorry, I skipped this slide. This is uh, one of the earliest advertisements that we think um, was for the figure horse, uh, only it's down in Connecticut. So here we go. Now we arrive at the moment when uh, very famously Justin Morgan had his horse. Um, Justin Morgan uh, acquires this horse uh, in the summer of 1792. And here is one of the early advertisements for this horse. You can see it's placed in April of 1793. And he's doing the same thing that he did with his other horses in Springfield. He is advertising this horse, uh, in this case, at a couple of different locations, different stables and different um, 
taverns. Uh, and he calls it figure here. So this is partially where we get the name figure in some coincidental, not an uncommon name for stallions at this time. If you read as many stallion advertisements from the 1790s as I have, uh, you see other figures. Uh, it seems to have meant something like a fine figure of a horse. So it's kind of like calling a horse beauty or Jack or Blackie or something like that. It's not a terribly original horse name. Um, and this, this image here, which some have said is the only known um, image of Justin Morgan and figure during, during their lifetime, is also a stock image. This is the equivalent of him having gone to the newspaper and said, I like that one, and them just running it. You see this image in other stallion advertisements of the time period as well. So unfortunately, we don't have any um, original images of either Justin Morgan or his horse. But he's advertising this horse. Um, primarily in the Randolph area, although as you can see here, um, he jumps over to Lebanon occasionally. So 17, he acquires the horse in the summer of 1792 and starts advertising it then. He advertises it through 1793. He continues to advertise it through 1794. And then he advertises it um, into 1795. And this is the advertisement where Morgan himself talks a little bit about um, the heritage uh, of this, this horse he has owned now for, for four years, um, that he sprang from a curious horse owned by Colonel Delancey of New York. But the greatest recommendation that I can give him is he exceeding, he's exceeding sure and gets curious colts. Curious seems to have been a common word in horse advertisements at that time, um, meaning not necessarily the way we would think of it, but meaning um, sort of special colts, uh, really interesting, different than you would see uh, normally. Uh, this incidentally, this has appeared in the Rutland Herald. So he's advertising pretty, pretty widely. And as you can see here, the horse is now no longer in the Randolph area. The horse is up in Williston uh, at the stable of Samuel Allen. And this is where we start to figure out, we have our first big break in the story. Um, and we don't 100% know what happens next. So I, I realize I'm giving this talk to a Woodstock audience and a lot of you are thinking, there's a state historic marker in downtown Woodstock that tells us exactly what happens next. We know what happens next. Um, I'm sorry to, to sort of dash this, but uh, so the story that uh, the Woodstock state marker tells is that Justin Morgan died in uh, 1795, in 1798, excuse me, and in payment of his debts, um, he gave this horse in his will to a man named William Rice, who was a sheriff in, um, in Woodstock, and that Rice owned him for a number of years and then passed him on to his next owner. Um, we can actually conclusively prove that is not true. Uh, we know for a fact that Justin Morgan did not own this horse when he died. It was not in his will. We have his will. Uh, it lists everything he owned when he died, and we know that um, everything he owned was sold in payment of his debts. He left behind uh, a number of children. His wife had passed away previously, um, and uh, he just there was no horse listed in the inventory of his estate at all. So Justin Morgan no longer owned this horse when he died. What had happened to him? Um, Betty Bandell did a biography of uh, Justin Morgan. That's a really outstanding book called Stranger in a Strange Land. And she has been able to conclusively track down that um, in 1796, um, shortly before he passed away, and when he was already quite ill, we don't exactly know how he died. Um, he seems to have had some kind of lung ailment, possibly tuberculosis, but we, he already knew he was ill in 1796. Um, Morgan traded uh, something for a large tract of land in Moortown, uh, a little bit of north of Randolph, Vermont. Now, um, he traded this, he purchased this land from a man named Samuel Allen. Bandel's theory um, that is that um, Morgan traded this horse figure for this piece of land in Moortown so that he would have something to give to his children, essentially. You know, giving a, a breeding stallion to your children, his oldest son was, I think, 10 or 11 years old at the time. He's not really in a position to do all the business work that, that's required to manage a horse, but a piece of land, especially to an early New England settler, feels like a sure thing. That feels like something you can have and keep and pass on to your family. Um, it's basically money in the bank. So uh, Justin Morgan sold his horse. He only owned this horse for a uh, little over four years, maybe two years longer than that, if, if you believe the, the theory that he owned the horse while he was living in Springfield and just was living in Vermont, but had left the horse behind. But he only actively manages him as a breeding stallion in the state of Vermont for four years, which is interesting um, when you think about the fact that, A, the horse is 
breed, the entire breed, of course, will be named after Justin Morgan himself. And second, that a lot of the early stories that we hear and a lot of the legend that builds up around this horse, almost all of those stories happen during Justin Morgan's lifetime. So the fame of this horse and these amazing things that this horse does, which I'll talk to you about in just a second, all had to have happened or, or are said to have happened within about a four or five year period in Randolph, Vermont, from about 1791 to let's, let's charitably say 1796, although we know that the horse is already physically with Samuel Allen, his next owner, um, as you can see, as of the spring of 1795. So what are these stories? Um, if you've read, again, Margaret Henry's book, Justin Morgan Had a Horse, um, you know a few of them. There's one story um, during a season when figure was leased out to a hired man named Robert Evans clearing stumps from a field. He spent a whole day clearing stumps from a field and they came down to the sawmill where there was a huge log that two enormous draft horses were trying to move from its, its place by the river to the sawmill and they were unsuccessful. These two big horses couldn't budge this single log. And Evans is supposed to have said that even after a long day of clearing stumps in his field, absolutely my horse, my horse can do that. My horse can move that. Um, I'll bet you a gallon of whiskey that my horse can do that. And everyone said, no, that's just ridiculous. We're not going to take your money. He said, all right, well, I'll up the stakes. He said, just to make it an even fair pull, let's put every man here on that log. And then my horse can pull that. And then I'll have really earned this gallon of whiskey. So supposedly they did that. Every man at the sawmill uh, got on this huge log and this horse figure pulled the log to the sawmill in two tries that two other large horses had not been able to do. Um, there's another story uh, that uh, two fine gentlemen with two racehorses came over from New York and they were looking to drum up some local competition, make a little bit of money betting on the side, beating out these local Vermont horses with their New York racehorses, which may have been traveling overland to New Hampshire where there were established tracks. And here comes Figure uh, and Justin Morgan. And figure beats both of these pedigreed New York thoroughbreds flat out. He outraces them. He outruns them again after a day in the fields. Um, he is supposed to have been working the fields all day and then be plenty fancy to take you to church on Sunday. So these stories both appear in Lindsley and Battelle's books um, from people who supposedly knew the horse and supposedly knew Justin Morgan were in the Randolph area at this time. Why, why are people telling these stories? Um, you know, if, if you love these stories, I'm not going to sit here and say, no, there's, there's just no way that's, that didn't happen. There's no chance. That's not a real thing. It's, it's really hard to prove a historical negative. And quite frankly, I'm less interested in proving them wrong than I am in asking, why, why do we tell these stories? What do these stories have to say about early Vermont, about what we want to think about early Vermont. And Lin remember Lindsay and Battelle are writing in, he's doing his research in the 1850s and the 1860s, 1870s, at a moment when the revolutionary generation is gone. And at a moment when a lot of people are creating stories about the founding fathers, right? E e all these stories about Ethan Allen, all these stories about George Washington. This is like this 25 year time period when these are all getting written down and shared. So of course we're sharing founding Vermont stories about this horse as well. So what does it say that this, this little horse, and he was a apparently on the small side, this little horse works in the fields all day and then he beats out every other horse for still working and performing feats of strength at the end of the day. That says a lot about what Vermonters want to think about themselves and about their state and about that moment in history, right? You, you keep clearing the land. You make it a quote unquote civilized place um, for farmers and for people to live. And then there's the, the beating out the New York racehorses, right? These two pedigreed racehorses. And sometimes you see retellings of this where they get off a horse trailer because they couldn't even um, be ridden or driven to the, the racetrack. They were so precious. Um, they get off a horse trailer and they're, they're, they're horses that have pure blood and they're valuable horses. And of course, they're from every, the place every early Vermonter loves to hate, which is New York. Um, and... No question, these, these fancy gentlemen are beat by this scrappy little horse and this, this school teacher or singing master um, that is a local pride. I mean, what a great story 
for uh, for the early Vermont, the founding of Vermont. Like, wh- why wouldn't you want to tell yourself that story about this horse that's so closely identified with early Vermont stories? Um, those those sort of tell us about how people want to feel about early Vermont history, by the especially by the time they're recounting them fifty years later. Um, all those, you know, they're recounting them by people who were, and especially they're recounting them by people who are children uh, at the time, young people. It's pretty rare when you get to Lindsley and Battelle that you get someone who says, oh yeah, I was, a, I was an adult. I was, you know, 30 or 40 years old. And I remember seeing this horse in the pasture when Morgan brought him back from wherever they say they brought him back from. Again, they tell a ton of different stories um, about where this horse came from. So these are children um, who saw these things and then who were telling these stories to Lindsley and Battelle, largely, not exclusively, but largely children. Um, Justin Morgan Jr., uh, Morgan's son, uh, tells a number of these stories uh, to Lindsley and Battelle. And he's the one also who says that the horse is sold to William Rice to cover his father's debts. Again, he was 10 or 11 years old when his father died. Um, He had been living on and off with neighbors and relatives in the neighborhood. He wasn't entirely living with his father because his father was so ill. So, you know, it's, it's a little unfortunate, but he's not really a reliable narrator uh, about his father's life, uh, although he does uh, offer quite a lot. Um, to Lindsley and Battelle. Uh, and Lindsay and Battelle are also re- reprinting some articles that come up as early as the 1830s about the origins of the Morgan horse. So what happens to this horse figure? Um, he is uh, sold on um, Sorry, I got a little ahead of myself here. Here's a, a, an image of a figure uh, that Lindsley com- uh, commissioned. He sort of did a, a, a police um, recreation of, of the horse by sending off to a, a, an artist. Here are all the possible descriptions of this horse. Here's what he must have looked like. I don't think it's a terribly good illustration, but it shows you some things that we think of when we think of the Morgan horse, that that upright shoulder, um, that solid neck, that sort of close coupledness, um, and the really sh- the shorter back and the really solid build. Here's an illustration uh, from Margaret Henry's Justin Morgan had a horse uh, of a uh, figure supposedly uh, pulling logs. Um, in the field, um, or excuse me, plowing a field with with Robert Evans. So Morgan dies in 1798. We know that Samuel Allen owns the horses of 1796. What happens to the horse? Here's the next time uh, the Morgan horse crops up in the official historic record, 1807. 10 years later, 10 plus years later. um, And by now he has moved on from being figure as advertised from Justin Morgan uh, to being known as the Morgan horse. He's now got a reputation, uh, enough so that um, the Goss family uh, and Randolph, and the Goss family uh, is both the St. Johnsbury and Randolph, and they pass him back and forth between a number of them over the next couple of years, supposedly. Um, The Morgan horse, he's already established a sort of legend for himself. Well, what's he doing in these 11 years um, in between? Um, We don't really know. So this is my recreation. of what is commonly given as um, the owner timeline for Justin Morgan uh, or the Morgan horse or figure from um, a possible first owner, um, which is Samuel Whitman of Hartford, Connecticut, um, down to his last owner, his last supposed owner, Levi Bean of Chelsea. That's a lot of different owners, right? The horse was almost 30 years old when he died, um, but that's still a lot of owners. That's a different owner almost every two years. Uh, And as you can see, in some years, 1796 to 1797, um, an owner every couple of months. So I've color-coded this list. Um, Green is for a good, clear documentation in contemporary sources um, or or very near contemporary sources. Within a year or two, we have someone saying, oh yeah, so-and-so definitely owned or owns currently this horse. As you can see, like, for example, with John Goss of Randolph, we have the actual stallion advertisement. The yellows are from things that are documented near contemporary sources, what I'm calling between 10 and 15 years within the, um, the actual event. Uh, sometimes it's a footnote, like uh, the James Hawkins ownership is a footnote in uh, a history of Montpelier saying that James Hawkins was an early blacksmith in Montpelier, bought the horse from Jonathan Shepard, and um, 
and then owned him for a brief time and uh, supposedly raced him in Montpelier as well. And then the uh, the red ones are people that are um, I have found either no conclusive contemporary documentation for, or uh, as in, I'm sorry to say again, Woodstock, as in William Rice, I just, I have not found a single shred of evidence uh, among any Morgan historians who have gone before me or in my own work to document that William Rice um, owned this horse. I can't find any evidence of um, Robert Evans supposedly having, having owned him um, or a couple of later owners that you can see um, there. They're commonly accepted as owners because Lindsley and Battelle have reported them. I'm trying to apply uh, a really picky uh, standard to my own list of his owners. Even if half this list is true, he still gets traded around a lot, right? And this fits with the other stallions that Justin Morgan had advertised, for example. Um, you know, they get passed around a lot for genetic diversity um, to, to share uh, back and forth uh, in different parts of Vermont, as you can see, he's going from Randolph uh, over to Claremont, New Hampshire, St. Johnsbury, Montpelier, um, Williston, uh, so on and so forth. So he's making uh, an impact in different areas of the state. Uh, and he's hiring quite a lot of horses. And this is really, um, these years are really what establish uh, the Morgan horse breed and this horse's reputation. Because again, Justin Morgan just did not own him for all that long. Um, he just did not have the time to establish him as, as a stallion um, to have created, quote unquote, the Morgan horse breed. And now we move into sort of another myth uh, of the figure horse which is that um, supposedly, no matter what mare this horse was bred to, the foal of, of, that, mare, uh, of that union came out exactly like figure. He stamped his offspring such that he single-handedly or exclusively created a new breed of horses. Just boom, carbon copy um, line of, of new Morgan horses all in a row. Um, if you're thinking that sounds ridiculous, that is not how genetics work. You are you are right. That is not, in fact, how genetics work. Um, it, it's just it's it's physically impossible um, for every horse that this this horse was bred to, no matter what, um, for him to have have sired horses that look exactly like him. You know, I'll buy some stallions. You know, even today, absolutely put a strong stamp on their offspring. I will buy that there are. are very common characteristics that he puts on an offspring. But I think that, that telling the story, um, and people still say this, telling that story that Justin Morgan's horse figure single-handedly created the Morgan horse breed is doing a great disservice to Vermont farmers and horse breeders at the time. It, it, it frankly makes them sound kind of stupid. Um, because, you know, but by, by this time and since People have been breeding and taking care of horses. We have known how to breed horses. We have known how to create certain characteristics in the offspring of horses. I think it is more likely that the farmers of Vermont, um, those who are looking for a certain kind of smaller, strong, but still flashy, close coupled, um, equally comfortably being ridden or driven kind of horse, um, I think that there's an argument that they knew what they were doing and they were breeding mares that... Um, that they wanted to, to improve upon, that they wanted to create a similar sort of uh, type of horse. And then they then capitalized on those with the next generation and the next and the next. So by the time Lindsley and Battelle come along, you know, who's to say how many mares figure was bred to and the foals turned out nothing like um, figure so they don't get recorded in these books. Um, and there is a strong type because people have recognized it as a type and they, they've recognized a value in this specific style, which would become a breed of horse. Um, so there's puncturing that myth. I apologize again if that's one of your, your favorites that figure every single horse he single handedly is the sire of a specific breed. Unlikely. And towards the end of his life, we have uh, one last uh, big myth uh, about this horse. You may or may not recognize this portrait. Um, this is James Monroe, his founding father and uh, fifth president of the United States, president from 1817 to 1825. Here's the, here's the story, uh, how the story goes. Uh, Monroe visited Vermont. While he was in Vermont, he was invited to take part in a parade and he was offered a figure of the Morgan horse to ride in the parade. He did so and upon dismounting, remarked on the quality of the horse. Sometimes he's supposed to have said something um, much like Vermont breeds true horses like it's true men or what a remarkable horse you have here. Vermont produces such quality animals. Either way, he's supposed to have said something complimentary about the horse and by extension about 
Vermont. And this is supposed to have been particularly noteworthy um, because Monroe being from Virginia, he was assumed to have had um, some knowledge of horses being, being, have been the kind of person you want evaluating your horse and, and saying good things about your horse. Um, you see this story repeated again and again and again. It's actually how uh, Margaret Henry's book, Justin Morgan Had a Horse, ends. So did it happen? We don't know for sure. Sorry, jumped ahead there. We don't know for sure. Um, more, the horse was living in Randolph, Vermont at the time period, so he would have had to travel from Randolph to Montpelier for this to have happened. Uh, it's usually named as being in Montpelier, sometimes in Burlington. Um, he would have been quite elderly at the time, towards the end of his life in his late 20s. So there's another um, argument uh, possibly against. Um, here's another argument against. Um, while we do, Monroe did in fact visit Vermont during the time period he was supposed to have, he was visiting all over New England. We know that he went to Montpelier. He, uh, we know that he engaged, uh, he rode a horse in Montpelier, whether it was part of a parade or not. I think parade's probably a little bit of an exaggeration, but he rode the horse from, if you know Montpelier, he rode the horse from, he mounted it roughly on, on River Street, um, on the other side of the Winooski River, crossed the river, came to the corner of State and Main, turned left onto State Street, and dismounted in front of the State House, which uh, was located then where the current uh, Supreme Court building is now. That's all we know. We actually know what Monroe had for breakfast that morning. We know what he did when he got to the State House. We know the remarks that the children of Montpelier made to him upon his arrival in Vermont. He's not an unstudied man. He was president of the United States, and this was an important trip. Um, people knew what he was doing. Not, not one single time in a contemporary source do we have, oh, and then he rode the Morgan horse, and he said these amazing things about it, and everyone cheered. Um, is it possible he rode the Morgan horse? Sure. Uh, you know, I, again, it's, it's hard to prove a negative. So someone could have brought him up from Randolph to Montpelier, um, introduced him to Monroe, and it just didn't make it into the historical record for the moment. But again, we know what he had for breakfast that morning. Um, this feels unlikely, but why do we want to tell? I mean, this what someone feels obvious to me. Wouldn't you want uh, a noted horseman and the president of the United States to be saying complimentary things about uh, Vermont at this time period? That's, that's sort of the ultimate like recognition from on high for how amazing Vermont and Vermonters are that they produced this horse um, and that the president is, is praising them for it. So uh, figure dies in 1821 uh, under the care of his last owner in Chelsea, Levi Bean. He's supposed to have been kicked by another horse in the field and the wound just never healed properly. You know, he's also 30 years old, um, roughly, give or take, 30 years old at the time period. That's a good age for a horse even in the year 2020. It's an exceptionally good age for a horse in 1821. So um, whether we can like place blame squarely at Levi Bean's feet or not, I, I don't know. Um, but he's buried today in uh, in Chelsea. You can still see this grave that's here um, by the side of the road in the field where he is buried. Um, and his legacy lives on today. During his lifetime, he was bred to many, many, many horses. And it was largely the next generation of stallions that would create um, this type of Morgan horse. You can see those um, the three of his most prominent of his sons. There were other stallions that he sired that went on to... Um, continue to sire Morgans, but these are the three most prominent. Woodbury, Bull Rush, and Sherman uh, are usually the, the horses that you can trace a Morgan horse today's lineage back to. And pretty quickly through the 19th century, this becomes a type of horse that Vermont is, is known for. So much so that sometimes when they leave the state, they become known as the Vermont horse, not necessarily the Morgan horse. And this gets me into one of the last myths I wanna talk about. Supposedly, no matter what horse figure was bred to, all of the foals came out looking like carbon copies of figure. No matter what, they, he stamped his offspring so strongly that he single-handedly created a new breed of horse. As you can probably guess, this argument has a couple of flaws in it. One, genetics don't work that way. They just, they just don't. You know, you do a basic Punnett square and you don't get carbon copies <laughs> um, from only one half of a horse's DNA or one half of a human's DNA for that matter. Two, it makes Vermont farmers look really stupid. Uh, you know, if a lot of the stories we tell about this horse figure are meant to tell us also about how amazing Vermonters in the early Republic period are, then, uh, you know, saying that they, they brought any old mare up to this horse to be bred just, just makes them look dumb. They knew what they were doing, right? They, they knew there was a type of horse that they wanted to create. And that type um, 
you know, was complemented and, and perhaps perfected and exemplified by this stallion and then by his progeny. You know, you can see these three horses also look um, like that, that woodcut that Lindsley created. So they were, they were making choices. They were making smart choices about the mares that they wanted to breed to this horse and then the, the foals that they got out of that union. Moreover, you know, who's going to be the guy who um, got a foal that didn't look anything like figure and then still like 40 years later remembers that horse so vividly that he tells it to Lindsay and Patel and make sure it gets in the stud book. You know, I think the horses that were bred by by figure that don't end up being typey, that don't end up being like of this strain of small, compact, solid, uh, versatile horse. I think there are almost certainly some that out there that got forgotten uh, or, you know, no one remembered that they were sired by this horse. That being said, um, he absolutely did stamp his offspring. I mean, that's not it's certainly likely stallions today can do that. And very quickly, there becomes a type and a breed established that's, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, really starts to, to get built by Lindsley and then later is confirmed um, by Battelle and his work to build a registry. And the Morgan horse is, in fact, the official mammal of the state of Vermont today. Uh, here are two different styles of, of Morgan horse, the modern Morgan horse that we uh, see today. The horse on the left is a stallion, when named Weathermont Ethan, um, who would off people would probably argue him as a, as a foundation or a throwback or a quote unquote true Morgan today. The horse on the right, I don't know um, its name, uh, but it's more of a modern type of what we call a sport Morgan um, today, slimmer built, but you can absolutely still see the similarities, right? That shoulder um, angle, that nice close coupled back, um, that upright neck, that really alert headset. Um, they're absolutely still uh, typey Morgan today. So I'm going to end this um, by uh, saying that a lot of you probably know of the Morgan horse through Margaret Henry's book, Justin Morgan Had a Horse. Um, this was uh, a book that really popularized the Morgan horse with the public. Margaret Henry uh, is today known as an author of, of horse books for children, but this was actually the first time she wrote a horse book for children. It was her first um, attempt at the genre. And it had published in 1942. And it, it's got all of the myths that I told you about. It's got the horse race. It's got um, the, the, the log pole. It's got the ride by Monroe. It's got the he was passed from owner to owner and sometimes abused. And in fact, it ends with this ride by Monroe. And someone asks the, the young uh, boy protagonist who is sort of our, our human uh, main character in this book alongside the figure horse at the very end, where does this horse come from? He's just amazing. Why we see him for? And the, the boy Joel says, well, I don't rightly know. He didn't come from anywhere. I guess that makes him American just like us. And is there a more perfect way to end a story about this horse who is supposed to exemplify early Vermont and in fact, the early American Republic in 1942 when we are telling stories as patriotically as we possibly can in the middle of World War II, that sort of sums it all up. The stories we want to tell about this horse, the way that he's gotten incorporated into the early American story and is supposed to have exemplified this early American story. And he's a true American because of the things he did and the things he accomplished and the way he, he went about the world, not because of where he came from. So... On that note, um, I want to end this story uh, of this horse uh, by saying also that my, my research is always ongoing. Uh, I got fascinated by this story because of my interest in horses and history. I continue to be fascinated by it because it's such a complicated story, because it does tie up so many of these myths, these stories, and these things that we want to tell, these stories that we want to tell um, about the early American um, period and the things, the ways we think about that time period and how they reflect um, where we are in the present, as, as in my, my argument was, um, they always do. So we continue to talk about this horse and to tell stories about this horse and to, and to, in many cases, have very strong feelings about this horse. And I also want to end by saying if I have, have told you your favorite story about this horse is wrong, I'm not saying that in the least. Uh, I have absolutely no problem with people still making the argument that these things happened. All I can do is present the most likely case according to the evidence um, and say there's still tons of room within this horse's story um, for your favorite story about this horse. I have my own. Um, and we will keep telling those stories uh, about this horse who was, no matter how you slice it, no matter how you sort of play myth making or anything like that, he was a remarkable horse. And he did in fact, um, leave a legacy in the, in the form of the Morgan horse breed today.
A lot of them aren't necessarily um, named as certain pedigree mares, right? So in Lindsay and Patel's book, um, and they're actually on Google Books, so if you want to take a look at what this actually looks like, sometimes they're the the Goss mare or the Smith mare or um, the something or other mare uh, or the, the, the mare from this town or other. So sometimes they're listed as that. Um, the, the horses that figure was bred to that then produced the, that first generation of Morgans. And we do also know there are also named uh, mares among figures progeny. So we do know that there are named first generation Morgan mares. Um, as to the actual lineage of the horses figure is bred to, do we know if any of those are pedigreed horses? Not a whole lot. Some Patel and Lindsay get into this a little bit more um, because they're very invested in sort of proving certain lineages um, for, for early Morgan horses. Um, so there's speculation about some of them. I don't know that we have a good like scientific survey um, of those early mares. Um, but anyone who breeds horses knows that mares are crucially important in, in what you get for a foal. So um, I wish we did know more. Um, that would be a super interesting research project. And maybe when I've worked a little bit more on figure, um, I can sort of work back to those owners because in large part, because of that first generation of Morgans, we know uh, we can track a lot of who figure was bred to. So we can verify some of where he is at a time um, based on those breedings. Uh, are there any strawberry roan Morgans? I don't think so. Um, I don't believe Morgans come in roan, which is a genetic characteristic. They are most commonly bay or chestnut. Um, I've seen them, uh, the bay or chestnut are black. They also come in um, bay, chestnut, and black. I've seen them gray. Uh, I've seen them palomino. I've seen them in buckskin. Um, I'm trying, again, if there are Morgan horse people uh, following along who want to tell me you've seen a purebred strawberry roan Morgan, please do. Um, but I, I don't, I've never seen, um, a Roan Morgan. Um, I bet that would be really striking. Uh, Rachel asks, is it possible Justin Morgan rode figure down to Woodstock for treatment by a Woodstock physician and that's the Woodstock connection? Sure. Yeah. We, so um, I, it wouldn't surprise me at all if, if Morgan uh, either rode the horse to Woodstock to visit Woodstock. We do know he was connected to William Rice. Um, the William Rice thing doesn't come out of out of nowhere. Um, we do know that they had some connection. William Rice, I believe, was one of the executives of his will. Um, so there is a plausible Justin Morgan, William Rice connection. Um, what has been pretty conclusively disproven is that Morgan left the horse to Rice in his will and that Rice then owned that horse in Woodstock. Um, there is still a thin sliver of time between uh, Samuel Alliston and, excuse me, Samuel Allen and Williston and his proven next owner, Jonathan Shepard in Montpelier, there are a couple of months there where the horse could have relocated from Williston to Woodstock and then made his way back to Montpelier. Um, I have not found any evidence that that happened, but there is a, a, a short gap during which we know the horse was not advertised um, by any specific person, so he could have been moving around. Um, and again, there is a William Rice connection. Um, the person who, who first advances the story that the horse went to William Rice in Woodstock um, was Justin Morgan Jr. Um, he, he specifically says, um, you know, my father left the horse uh, to William Rice who cared for him in the last, um, last phase of his illness and therefore Morgan owed him uh, money and he paid that money with this horse. Again, we, we have Morgan's will. Um, we know exactly what he owned. We know exactly what books he owned. Um, and the horse does not appear there. And we have him advertised by Samuel Allen and then Jonathan Shepard before Morgan's death um, as, as belonging to them. So um, we know he didn't own the horse at the time of his death. And, um, you know, I, I, I feel for Justin Morgan Jr., who, who seems to have spent a fair amount of time um, sort of writing about his father's legacy in, in to various newspapers. And actually on other things seems to have been a, a reliable source. Um, but uh, it, on this, he doesn't seem to have. Um, so Gal Galaxy, you're asking if you could just repeat the strawberry roan bit again. Um, it, so my, my re-answer on the strawberry roans is that I've never seen and do not think that Morgan's come in strawberry roan. Um, most commonly they come in bay, chestnut, and black. Um, sometimes they come in gray. Uh, I've seen buckskin. I've seen some very striking palominos, um, but I've never seen one in Strawberry Roan. And again, I, I would be delighted to be wrong because I think that would be a really striking horse. So if there are any Morgan horse people, I know that, that sometimes there are breeders um, uh, who, who come to, to my talks. If you want to come, 
comment in the chat and let me know that, that you know of a strawberry run Morgan. I would be delighted to, to find out. But I, I strongly suspect since that has a genetic component to it, it doesn't spontaneously um, come up. Uh, I strongly suspect that, um, that there are not any. But I would be delighted to be wrong because I think that would be a really striking horse. Um, any, other, any other questions? Uh, Angela um, says, I worked on a Morgan horse farm in Lexington, Kentucky. We saw hundreds of Morgan's mares and never saw a strawberry roan. Yeah. Um, and and even, even colors that are not bay, black, or, or chestnut are real hard to find. Um, I know there are some breeders uh, who have some, some very nice buckskins and, and palominos uh, and some grays, but you don't see them very common. The original Morgan horse was a dark bay. Um, that's that's pretty conclusive. Um, he's described enough times that we know he's a small dark bay. Um, all three of his, um, I believe all three of those original stallions were, were also bay. Uh, the, one of the other prominent st early stallions was a black, a couple of the mares are chestnuts. So it's a, a pretty well established color base to begin with. And when you look at pictures of the ideal Morgan online, they're almost always that, that beautiful sort of mahogany bay with the, um, and I realized for non-horse people, uh, bay means they're brown uh, with a black mane and tail and usually black points um, on the ear, uh, on the ears and on the legs. So it's a very specific sort of genetic horse color um, that Morgan's commonly come in. Um, and chestnut is brown. So I realize I, I don't necessarily have an audience of horse people who know exactly what those colors mean. So uh, if there are any other questions, you're welcome to, as Ryan said, you're welcome to unmute yourself or type them up in the chat and I would be happy to, to try and answer. I'm gonna go dig up the Almanza Wilder horses after this because I'm, I'm curious now. Really, yeah, they're spectacular horses. Um, responding to Galaxy in the comments who says that they really like Morgans, I, I totally agree, they're phenomenal horses. Um, you know, I, taught, I, I was sort of quote unquote busting myths with this talk, but I, I genuinely love them as a breed. I think this fir the first Morgan horse is fascinating. Um, and I think that, that sort of thinking about and reflecting on his, his place in, in Vermont history and American history writ large um, is a really useful and important exercise. I've been saying for 10 plus years now that my next horse will be a Morgan. I've, I've ridden and known some spectacular ones. Oh, they are, they are I live on a horse farm. <laughs> yeah, great. I, I wish I lived on a horse farm, <laughs> but yeah. it's a lot of fun. Good, good. It's a lot of work, too. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Great. I have a pink horse. He's a Tennessee Walker. Oh, nice. Very nice. There, there's some speculation that there's some Morgan blood in the walkers, the Tennessee Walker horses, which are another early American breed, um, because we know they do get down to Tennessee and Georgia pretty early. Um, so there's some speculation that there's a little bit of a uh, little bit of Morgan blood in there. For some reason, I feel like Tennessee Walkers are from Tennessee. They absolutely are. Um, but we know that Morgan horses were down in Tennessee around the time when the Tennessee Walker breed was being developed. For, for those who uh, may not be familiar with the Tennessee Walker, they're, they are a breed from Tennessee, uh, and they're throughout the South now. And they were originally developed, the story goes, to be sort of smooth, um, gated horses. If you want to Google one and look at a video, they have this beautiful running walk that's very comfortable to ride. Um, and, uh, and they were developed as sort of circuit horses to... to ride long distances uh, comfortably. Mine, mine can be a little chicken sometimes. <laughs> but he doesn't nice. he jump. When he gets scared, he doesn't jump forward. He jumps to the side. Yeah. Unlike most horses. <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll go in all directions if they get, if they get startled. Uh, for sure. Yeah. I've, I've, I've ridden that myself. Does, does yeah. anyone else have, have any questions? Yeah, if there are any other, uh, the story of a Morgan surviving Custer's last stand, sure, that's a good one. Um, so for the, the question in the chat is about the story of a Morgan surviving Custer's last stand. If you remember how I, I talked about how Morgans became common um, cavalry horses. Um, so uh, Custer, when his, when his regiment was massacred out west, the only survivor um, of that, that battle, that massacre, was a, a Morgan horse um, who, I apologize, I'm completely blanking on the name, right, the name of the horse right now. Um, but the horse uh, was shipped, he was injured 
um, during the battle, but he was shipped back east and treated as a veteran of that regiment. And when he died, um, his hide was put on exhibit and it is uh, on exhibit at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History today. So you can go visit that Morgan horse um, in the Smithsonian. Uh, they, they crop up again and again at favorite, famous moments in American history. Um, Philip Sheridan, a Civil War general, uh, is said to have ridden his horse, uh, Comanche, thank you, the name of the horse was Comanche, um, the Morgan at Custon's Last Stand. Uh, Philip Sheridan's horse was a Morgan horse. He made a very famous uh, and fast ride uh, to arrive at the scene of a specific Civil War battle exactly on time, and there was a poem written about him, this ride, and this horse specifically, um, who he named um, Rienzi. Uh, originally, the horse's name was, uh, was Rienzi. Um, and it would, that was a Morgan horse. Uh, they were, oh, they were, yeah. Any other questions, um, in the chat? So is there like, where is this museum thing at? <laughs> so the, so there's a couple of museums I've talked about. The, uh, Comanche, the horse that's on exhibit at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History is at, in Washington, D.C., um, today, you can learn about Morgan horse history by going to the UVM Morgan Horse Farm. Um, I talked early on about Joseph Battelle. Um, towards the end of his life, Battelle purchased a great, bit of, great deal of land, uh, and he uh, established a Morgan horse farm where he bred Morgan horses. And um, late at the end of his life, he gave that farm to the federal government, where it became a cavalry remount station, where they actually bred Morgan horses um, to become part of the cavalry program. And then the government turned that, that farm and all of its horses over to UVM. Uh, and UVM still maintains that farm as a Morgan horse breeding farm today. Um, they have uh, a lot of things about Morgan history there. There's exhibits. Uh, and there are also quite a lot of Morgan horses that you can go visit. Some really, really stunning Morgan horses visits. They have the prefix. Um, so before their name, um, the, uh, the letters UVM. Uh, so UVM so-and-so um, yeah. designate the Morgan horse. So you can go visit the UVM Morgan horse farm um, today and, and learn more about them. And we also talk a little bit about Morgan horses at the Vermont History Museum, which is where, uh, where I work uh, as, during the day. Um, so question, uh, oh, the follow-up, in search of more and more grown Morgans. Um, so there has been some, if you want to look in the chat, there has been some uh, published work on, on determining whether or not there are Rowan Morgans and, and looking that up. So I'll definitely be checking that out. If you're interested, you should look in the chat for that reference. Did Norwich University have Morgans? Um, I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, I've never heard uh, of, Morgan, of Norwich University having uh, a breeding program. Um, I know they used um, local horses for cavalry training. Some of those may well have been and probably were uh, Morgans. You know, for a long time in Vermont history, the odds were better than even that, that any local horse was going to be in Morgan. Um, besides UVM, there are a couple of other universities um, that maintain um, breeding programs or have maintained in the past breeding programs of Morgan horses, UNH, uh, University of Connecticut, University of California, I believe Davis, um, UC Davis has a Morgan horse breeding program. So they have been, um, there have been, well, and, and there are of course still Morgan horse breeders across the United States and around the whole, around the world. Um, they originated in Vermont. We think of them as the Vermont horse, uh, and Vermont celebrates them, but they are they are by no means today exclusive to Vermont. You can find them uh, anywhere and everywhere. Uh, and in fact, the really big Morgan horse shows are are out west today. Um, are and I believe someone's going to correct me, but I believe it's in Oklahoma is the big national uh, Morgan horse show uh, today. 